Thanks, Jim. Hi, everybody. This is Alex from the Astro Imaging Channel. It's good to be back with you tonight. Tonight, we're going to go on an adventure, an adventure of a lifetime. Sid Freed is to, uh, here to tell us about his adventures in becoming an astro imager, and I think we'll get a pretty good story out of that. Uh, let's tell you about a few other things that are coming up in the near future. Um, we are a little we are a little talky tonight because the the whole crew, all of the um, TAIC volunteers, got together a little earlier and planned out what we're doing, what we've done over the last year, what we're going to be doing in the future, and we get some interesting things, a little good. Uh, yeah, changes for you and stuff like that. But we had a lot of good uh, time with that. At any rate, I wanted to show you that um, Sid's going to tell us about becoming an astroimager and, and some of the mistakes he's made, some of the high points he's had and stuff like that. That'll be today. Rod Pommier, who's been around a lot lately, he's been volunteering to do a lot of presentations lately. He's done some really good ones. He's going to be telling us about the dark side of astrophotography next week and um yeah he's got a few surprises he says a little bit of different processing techniques and some things like that uh, but he's going to be focusing on dark nebula of various sorts so that's going to be good and lately i've been getting a lot of images from tom spirek he's um uh, he's been doing some work um on the moon and he takes some really really interesting pictures so he's going to be volunteering for a couple of weeks here uh, a couple of shows in the next uh, in the upcoming don't forget you should already have your reservations for DAC. i know that i didn't get my room reservations so i've got a lot i gotta like drive hours and hours from my hotel to get to DAC. not quite but i didn't get the any of the good places but i'll be at me i hope to see you be sure to come on up and say hey um and volunteer to do a presentation because as you know starting may 14th we have empty spots, and we always need volunteers. Um, and we've got our anniversary show coming up where we're going to summarize where we've been for the year and a few other things and maybe get a couple of new tutorials in for you and some things like that. But uh, we need your help. So uh, always, what you do is you hit the contact button, you tell us who you are, and we will get you to volunteer to be on the calendar, okay? We could really use that. While you're here tonight, oops, I've got to I've got to turn my volume off here. Um, down here we've got everybody saying hey. All our all our favorites are here, and a whole lot more. I hope we've got um, 39 people watching already. We're proud of that. Um, don't forget to put your questions in over here. This part, uh, write a big red question marks if you can, um, and. Uh, so that we know where your questions are and ask questions as you go along and we'll get them to our presenter. That's one of the things that makes the Astro Imaging channel different uh, than other YouTube channels out there. Now, they get to edit their stuff and take the mistakes out. And when they're being goofy, they get to clean it up and all that other stuff. We don't get to do that. We go ahead and put our mistakes right out there. On the other hand, you can ask us questions and we can get them to the presenters. So that's enough about us. Let's go back to the meeting room here, and I'm going to stop presenting, stop sharing, and I'm going to ask um, Sid. Sid, can Alex, you come on? And, yeah. Uh, before, you know, I'm looking over on YouTube. But is everyone else seeing uh, the spinning ball? I'm seeing the uh, spinning ball. No, it's rolling for me. Oh, here it's back. Sorry. I'm good. Okay. okay. Um, as I was about to say, Sid, it's your turn. Take over, buddy. Okay, thank you. Are we there? Okay, you can put your, yeah, present. And there you go. Perfect. You're good. All right. Well, hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Sid Freedy, and tonight I'm going to take you on a journey from my entry into astrophotography from the world of being an absolute novice, which began about three years ago, into this state we're at today. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, some things I've learned, obviously some mistakes I've made, uh, some recommendations for someone just entering into astrophotography, and take a look at some of the things I'm doing right now, and then take a look at the future. 
So before I begin, I'd like to issue the following disclaimer. The following document is comprised of sometimes and in current ramblings of a wannabe astrophotographer. The opinions are solely my own, sometimes actually based on fact, and a compilation of information which I hope is mostly correct. Experienced astrophotographers may cringe at my process or conclusions. If so, I ask your help. I've made the journey with the help of various friends, forums, my local astronomy club, Facebook groups, and YouTubers worldwide. I feel like I'm drinking from a fire hose, and I'm excited about continuing my quest for knowledge and competence. First, just a little bit about myself. Uh, my background is in electrical engineering, primarily in the semiconductor world. I spent 15 years in the industry with Motorola and Intel, and then opened up my own business and technical sales and support, which uh, involved mostly semiconductors and components, and then moving into engineering computer design tools. And I retired in uh, 2018. So my hobbies include photography. I've been doing 35 millimeter DLSR for a long time. Uh, also fly radio controlled aircraft, uh, my other major hobby. Enjoy skiing, snow and water skiing, although uh, as I age a little bit, those become a little more difficult. Play a little guitar. Uh, my wife and I are interested in birding. We follow some of the birds here in Arizona, specifically some of the bald eagles. And oh, also uh, astrophotography. My journey primarily is interested in deep sky and nebulas and galaxies and clusters. My history is with the Canon DLSR primarily. Going back to the 70s, I used to shoot a lot of 35 millimeter black and white film. Some of you might actually recognize these 35 millimeter canisters. A lot of people today don't. Uh, later on, I moved into the digital world, shooting with a Canon DLSR. My current camera is a Canon uh, T3i. Primarily, I'm, I'm self-educated in photography and composition and layout and color and exposure with some minor experience in uh, raw processing and Photoshop. My wife and I did a lot of backpacking over the years up in the Arizona mountains. And literally you're sitting in the mortal one skies and it feels like you can just reach up and, and grab the stars and bring them into the tent with you. We also spent a lot of time at Lake Powell. Uh, again, mortal one type skies. My son and I would lay on the boat deck with our star charts, looking at the constellations and tracking the meteors and just really enjoying the nighttime sky. When my son was in middle school, about the fifth grade, I bought him a telescope. Actually. It was probably for me, but it was a great telescope at the time. It was basically one, turn on the power, it aligns itself, plate solves, has a list of the tonight's best viewing in the sky, had a really significant audio file that gave you a very uh, intense description of each object you were looking at. And it was really a, a great go-to scope. But then life got in the way. Other interests, my son moved from middle school into high school and baseball and high school and cars and girls and everything that teenagers deal with. And my work kept me pretty busy. I was a business owner. I was doing a bunch of traveling and life just kind of got in the way. But then I retired in 2018 and I joined my local astronomy club, East Valley Astronomy Club, and uh, in November 2019. And then right after that, COVID struck. So we came entirely in a virtual club. So we had remote meetings every month via Zoom and we were able to keep in contact with the club that way. So I dusted off my scope. And I joined the Backyard COVID Astronomers. And I uh, looked all over the sky, and my observation and targets essentially migrated into the interest in taking some photos. So I bought an adapter for my Canon uh, uh, digital camera and attached that to my Mead 6 inch and started taking some single exposures. This was my very first astrophotographer, my this photo. Uh, it was uh, horribly out of focus. Uh, you can almost make out the fact that it's probably M42, but this is what got me hooked. This is what may got, got me started on astrophotography and a chance to improve those photos and try to take the next step. So what were the issues? Well, it looked like I needed some longer exposures really to capture the targets. I'm sitting in Bortle 8, maybe Bortle 9 skies, and visual observing, I can see some of the brightest stars, but uh, M13 is sort of a fuzzy glob, the same for uh, M31 very difficult to discern anything beyond that. So I needed longer exposures to see what was there, and I needed to be able to track the targets. So the solution was, obviously, I needed a telescope with an equatorial mount. Well, Celestron at that time was having sort of a pre tamex cell, and they were discounting their edge scopes by $500, which sounded like a good deal. And obviously, bigger must be better. 
And I really at that time had no concept of the difficulty of long focal lengths and the difficulty it does present. But I thought, well, I can figure that out. After all, I'm an engineer. I understand math and physics and semiconductors and computers. How hard could it be? Well, it can be very hard. But I bought an Edge 11 scope and the CGM mount on the very last day of the sale in April of 2020. My order was placed at the end of April. First, the delivery was 60 to 90 days. Then it was beyond 90 days. And then it was, we don't have any idea what is going to occur. So for the next six months, I spent my time reading cloudy night threads that exposed my ignorance, reading the manuals to the equipment that I purchased, spending a lot of time on YouTube, looking at all sorts of videos. And I basically became a virtual expert without ever having touching the scope. And I also provided guidance on some of the threads. So fair warning, you need to be very careful in taking anyone's advice on the internet because it could have been me. Then buyer's remorse set in. I really had no idea what I was getting into. Like, what have I done? I spent lots of time on the internet looking at YouTube videos again, and it looks like I am way over my head. I should have bought a smaller focal length wide field scope. Ideal for nebulas, easy to focus, guiding is not as critical. It's smaller, lighter, easier to handle, less expensive accessories, easy to transport, and all those things that make it easier to enter into the world of astrophotography. So I take a look at astrophotography. I really look at the three C's. It involves capture, calibration, and increasing of a final image. So let me address those three phases individually, and then we'll, we'll go from there. The basic capture involves a lot of different things. First of all, it's assembly of the equipment. We need to have some type of alignment so we can actually find something in the sky. A lot of time doing observation. We need to figure out how to guide the camera, have a camera that we actually use, work on focus, what filters do we use, how do we select the target, how do we frame the targets, and then plate solving and dithering and meridian flip and automation and just a whole lot of things I had no idea or didn't understand anything about. Well, assembly was fairly straightforward. I got everything out of my box when I finally got delivered and set up my tripod and a space on my patio that was fairly stable. Uh, basically run everything into a powered USB hub. And then I have one hub, one uh, USB cable coming from the hub and of course power going both to the PC and the equipment on the, uh, the telescope. I had basically a, a 12 volt 10 amp power supply that uh, took care of the power for all the equipment. And they need to be able to actually find something. So to perform a go-to alignment, and it basically identifies my place in the universe. So the mountain knows where it is and so I can go to an object. Adding, un, uh, adding alignment stars increases the accuracy and it was really excellent for visual because the target would appear in the center of that eyepiece almost every time. Moving forward though, I need to figure out how to do polar alignments if I'm gonna do photography, obviously to accurately align with the North Celestial Pole and to be able to track the object across the sky at night. Capture and polar alignment. Polar alignment can be done a couple of ways. If the North Celestial Pole is visible, many uh, mounts have a, a, a channel through the scope with a polar scope where you can sight in. And there's various types of um, uh, pieces of equipment and uh, uh, utilities that can uh, establish a polar alignment fairly quickly. If polar alignment is not, or if, uh, North Celestial Pole is not visible, then that's me. My neighbor's tree obstructs my view of the North Celestial Pole. So it was either time for some midnight tree trimming, or uh, that doesn't really relate well to customer relations. Or Celestron had a pretty good program called ASPA, which does a polar alignment. And I currently use Nina, and they have really an excellent three-point uh, polar alignment process. So the first six weeks was really spending observation, getting familiar with the equipment. Getting familiar with the mount, the eyepieces, the alignment, doing polar alignments, go to wherever I could in the sky get a process for setting up and tearing down and storing the equipment and fine tuning the cabling connections and make sure everything fit together mechanically. Next step to successfully uh, get an image, I need a longer exposure. To take longer exposures, I need to track an object across the sky. To track an object across the sky, I need that equatorial mount. And to actually track that object, I need guiding assistance to that mount. Need to be polar aligned. So again, I can actually track that object across the sky. 
and which brings us into guiding. Guiding, basically, I need to locate a reference star in the sky to, to guide from, typically taking around a one-second exposure with the guide camera, establishing that guide star position, and continually sending pulses to the mount to keep that star centered. And that's where PhD2 comes in to bearing. Push, push your dummy. It's a fairly simple tool, which I think most amateur photographers use. It's free. It does a great job, and it's very highly supported. It's a great tool. A couple uh, solutions in, in providing guiding. One is an external guide scope. Uh, if this is our imaging camera, and uh, can you see my uh, my cursor? I hope so. Uh, we have a guide uh, that guide camera that uh, basically mounts the top of the imaging scope. And typically, kind of a rule of, of uh, formula is the image or the uh, focal length of the guide scope needs to be about a quarter of the focal length of the imaging scope. Uh, typically, that guide scope is somewhere between 50 or 150 mill, um, millimeters. Uh, they're low cost, they're light selection, they're available everywhere, they're easy to install, they just work very easily. But they start to get cumbersome when you get to a focal length of 1,000 millimeters or so. Well, the system I bought looks something like this. This is uh, my reducer, the guide camera, the filter wheel, and my imaging camera. And my scope is about a 2,000 millimeter scope. Well, if I use that formula, then I need about a 500 millimeter scope to externally guide. Well, that presents several problems. It's expensive for none, and it's also very heavy. And being heavy, my telescope is basically aluminum tube with some mirrors inside. And that weight will physically deform that aluminum tube and cause focusing problems and collimation problems. Also, as much of an issue is the moment of inertia, and that is basically the the distance squared from my rotational axis to the object itself. Now, our scopes are pretty balanced so that they'll sit in one position, but when you attempt to move the scope by adjusting your guiding, this moment of immersion becomes a large problem. So the solution to that is off-axis guiding. So anything basically greater than 1,000 millimeters, this solution works out very well. It's a little more critical at these uh, focal lengths because now my guide scope instead of guiding at 150 to maybe 200 millimeters, focal length is now guiding at the focal length of my scope, and that's about 2,000 millimeters. And that means it might be more difficult to find a guide star. Uh, one of the YouTubers that I follow is James Lamb, and he's great. He's uh, got some excellent discussions on guiding and how to set up an off-axis guider. He also has a Celestron SCT, something that's very similar to my scope, so it fit right in with my requirements. And so I followed his guidance. So if you'll excuse the pun on that one. But anyway, James Lance, an excellent YouTuber. I've used him a lot. Really enjoy his, his uh, uh, videos. So the guider itself looks something like this. This is a pickoff prism. So I've got light coming down the uh, optical train at a right angle. It shoots a, a portion of that light up into my guide camera. And we hope that there's a guide star in there. But basically, we're looking at something like this. Here's my imaging camera. There's my sensor. There's the prism that's picking off some of the light channel. And of course, the light channel has to be above my imaging sensor, so I don't disturb that. So the distance from my prism to my uh, guide camera and the distance from my prism to my imaging camera need to be the same. That way, when my imaging camera is in focus, my guide camera is always in focus, and I can get an accurate guide picture. And again, that's my particular setup. Now it's time to capture some data. Cameras. I had my trusty Canon DLSR. They have very, very good quality CMOS sensors. They make a powerful astrophotography camera. Most people already have one. Uh, they can be modified at the cost of a few hundred dollars specifically for astrophotography, but they really work well without that modification. The next step becomes a dedicated astro camera, and this is, how, this is the one that I purchased a little later on. And the primary reason here is being able to cool a sensor. And we'll talk a little bit about that, how that will add to being able to calibrate the light frames and provide a better image in the final result. Focusing. The next step. No matter how good your equipment is, if you're not in focus, you're recording garbage. If you can't see a nice, clear, crystal image, you don't really have anything to work with. Focusing message, uh, visual, basically you can go to a bright star, adjust the focus to achieve the smallest possible star. And to do that sometimes is kind of critical because making those fine focus adjustments are difficult. Uh, you can purchase a, a micro touch focuser, or for my solution was I basically put a clothespin on the focusing knob, which gave me a longer lever arm, and now I can make minute adjustments and focusing very accurately. 
with that knob mask, perfect for doing uh, focusing. Basically, a plastic frame that sits over your telescope. It has a predefined diffraction pattern. And to focus accurately, all you need to do is to center that diffraction spike right in the middle of that star that you're looking at. Works very well, it's very accurate, and it's very inexpensive. However, if you're going to do astrophotography, you really need a way to automatically focus your system. Through the night, your focusing can change due to a number of items, either temperature changes, uh, changes in seeing, uh, flexure, or other types of positioning problems. So in order to do that regularly and accurately, you need an autofocuser. Well, how does an autofocuser work? Basically, we have my autofocuser here, which is connected via a shaft to my focusing knob. And starting out at a focus point, which is near the focus that we're working with, probably established maybe perhaps with a dot knob mask, that focuser will make a few mechanical moves in each direction off of that focal point. It'll record then the HFR or F full width half maximum, some, some indication of that star's uh, focus point. It will then create a parabolic or a hyperbolic curve, and the low point of that curve then becomes the mechanical focus point. Uh, they're very accurate. Once it's set up, it handles itself very well. It can be a little bit of a uh, process to get it set up the first time or the first few times through, but once it's done, it works very, very well. Exposure. What's the correct exposure? This is one of the situations that becomes a conversation involving probably religion and politics. Uh, what is the correct exposure? Well, it depends. Uh, if we take too long an exposure, we'll saturate all the whites in our image and everything becomes white. Shorter exposures are typically better for light polluted skies because if we take longer exposures, the light pollution will swamp out our image. And in my particular area, my backyard is Bordel 8 at best and probably following into Bordel 9, so I've got a lot, a lot of light pollution problems to deal with. Now, filters will help us solve that problem, but they also increase the exposure times. And we'll take a little bit, look at that a little longer. But what do I do? I basically try to expose to start saturating the brightest stars. And I don't know if you can see those points, I hope you do, but there are like three small white points here on a unstretched light frame. These are three stars that have basically been driven to saturation. If I take a look at the rest of the frame when I stretch it, you can see there's a lot of information here. There's stars all over the place. I've got nebulosity, and this is my image. However, if I continue to expose this image, all those stars will become saturated and basically all become the same value. So I have no differentiation between my image and saturation. So basically, I experimented. I got some recommendations on some exposures took a bunch of exposures on the same target and compared them and kind of developed a personal database of my preferences for various, part various target types and equipments and filter combinations. And then take a look at the saturation on a uh, non-stressed exposure to make sure I'm not ex uh, exposing too long and again, saturating items that shouldn't be saturated. Also, uh, AstroBin is a great asset. Uh, hopefully most of you are probably familiar with that. Whenever I'm looking at an object that I want to image, I'll go to Astrobin and take a look at what some other people have done. You can search for uh, something that's similar to your equipment, take a look at that particular target, take a look at what they've done as far as exposure times and filters and the way they've set that up and give some idea perhaps of some starting times on what you're trying to do with the image. And also ask somebody. Use the experience of people who've been there and done that. Uh, local vendors, club members, friends, cloudy nights, etc. Uh, my local vendor is Starzona in Tucson, where I bought my equipment from, and they've been fantastic in providing some direction. Now, they have experience with all types of scopes and filters and light conditions and really a wealth of knowledge, and they've been very, very helpful in getting started. Uh, we'll take a little bit more look at this situation fur further, but basically this is a famous uh, Hubble palette of the pillars of creation. And the reason we talk about this being a Hubble palette is they're taking very narrow wavelengths of light, which are being emitted by typical emission nebulas at sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen, or SHO as it's called, and that's become the Hubble palette. So that helps defeat probably some of the problems of light pollution because now we're only taking a very small band with the three to seven nanometers, say, out of the entire light spectrum. Whereas historically, a lot of the light pollution filtered in here around this area from the parking lot lights, and my neighbor's porch light, and other areas, and our visible spectrum ranges from about the, the deep violet into 400 nanometers or so into the red and then venturing into the infrared about 700 nanometers. So three to 10 nanometers out of that whole light spectrum is very small and it does a great job in filtering out the uh, light pollution issues and becomes kind of the standard for narrowband imaging. What I did in my backyard in shooting color 
uh, I shoot with filters. And uh, the filters I use in my backyard are something called an L-Extreme. It's basically a hydrogen and oxygen dual, dual band filter at around the seven to nanometers. And it's perfect for that emission nebula that I just talked about. It will capture that particular bandwidth and then exclude the rest of the light pollution. Uh, L-Enhanced is one I also use when I'm taking a look at deep space objects that uh, involve reflection nebulas. So that's a little wider around the oxygen bandwidth, which will allow some of that blue light to be captured. That's typical from emission of re reflection nebulas. And then L-Pro is uh, perfect for galaxies because it has a wider bandwidth around those colors that exist in galaxies. Plus, it still enables you to screen out some of that light pollution. But as with all of these filters, you're going to increase your exposure time by maybe three to 10 times because you're letting in very, very much less light around a very narrow bandwidth. So you have to be prepared to take much longer exposures. Now, we need to find a target that we can image. And to do that, we need a coordinate system that allows us to very accurately identify where the target is in the sky. And it'd be very helpful to visually see that target and see how it will frame up in our particular uh, situation in camera. Our coordinate system is RA and DEC, right ascension and declination. And right ascension is the number of hours behind the sun that our target is on March 21st, or the vernal equinox. And declination is the angle when passing through the meridian. Now, this took a while for me to get my head around. And I found a couple of videos that do a very, very good job of talking about the explanation of what is right ascension and what is declination, how do we identify it, how we use it. And in particular, uh, we have one from this gentleman. And I see the ultimate professor, the bow tie on the whiteboard, and he does this with every one of his presentations. He's great, very detailed. and. I think we lost them. Yeah, we lost our presenter. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Did we lose him? Yeah, I guess we he yes, we clicked did. the wrong off button. Uh so why don't I put a little note? Uh if he if he closed the browser, he'll hopefully realize it here shortly yeah. and come back into the call. <laughs> Can someone send him an email just in case? Uh yeah, I will. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Today, we're going to hear from part of what Sid has to tell us about how, no, that's enough of that. He's really doing a good job explaining everything you need to know to become an Astro Imager, too. So um, anybody have any questions over there in Not besides so direct? Well, let me see. Direct, direct. All how about we... filters for comets? But I guess we can't ask our presenter because okay. he's not with us. But Tarek has been asking us for what he should get for his um, for his new rig. Direct, there's several things you've got to consider about whether you want to use a, um, uh, or what you want to use, okay? If you have a short focal length scope, um, you can use a, an attached telescope and you know, take it from there uh, and, and have it your guide camera on a separate telescope. If, however, what you want to do is, um, if you've got a longer focal length scope, then you're you're going to need an off-axis guider just because it has to be that much more accurate to do things. But there's also another thing going on that I'm not sure we've gotten through to you in our little messages that we swap back and forth. Certain constructions of telescope tubes are more stable in and of themselves. That is, um, they um, they shake. Okay, the the mirror on a Smith Cassegrain telescope focuses by moving the big mirror. That's a lot of weight to be moving back and forth, and it's very hard to get those things so stable that they don't shake and move. And so, um, every thing, every time that thing moves a little bit, you want to see it in real time. And you have to have an off-axis guider or an on-axis guider in order to see it in real time. You can't use a separate scope to do that. Um, to a lesser extent, but the same kind of thing is happening on a secondary mirror in a Newtonian. Um, it shakes a little bit, so you want to follow that in, in real time. In a refractor, everything's pretty solid. 
in an RC, they're a little more solid, but they do have some movement, you know, so it's all a question of, of it. But in an RC, it's got enough focal length that you're going to need an off-axis guide or something that gives you real-time image uh, of the star that you're actually trying to guide on. Did I get that kind of right, everybody else up here in the Astroimaging Channel group? Yeah, okay. The only thing I would add to that is that uh, if you if you use an off-axis guider or an on-axis guider, you eliminate any possibility of any kind of differential flexure. So if you have flexure between the the guide scope that doesn't match the flexure of your of your main OTA, uh, it can it can cause issues. When you use a, a uh, an off-axis guider, you are guaranteed to be um, uh, to be seeing the same thing that you're shooting uh, because you've you've literally only got one uh, optical path there. So right, and refractor tubes again are less subject to all the flexure that could go on uh, in the focuser of a newt or uh, the focuser and the tube of an SCT. So. And I'll add as well. Um, so I started using an off-axis guider with my schmidt cassegrain with my 8 inch at f6.3 and even with the reducer on at f6.3 i had a hard time getting guide stars in my relatively sensitive qhy 5l2 guide camera uh, especially during galaxy season so i ended up having to upgrade to a load star and i i, I got to use like an older load star on not even the current version and it does an excellent job i always have guide stars with the load star in there and the snr of each load star or each guide's each guide star is much higher than with the older camera or the qhy camera so uh you especially if you have a slow focal ratio telescope like now i'm using it at f10 on my nine and a quarter i still can get guide stars but having a more sensitive guide camera may be necessary particularly for slower telescopes like schmidt cassegrains and and marcia was asking about finding guide scars in an off-axis guider um, there's some planning involved in that. So you can have planetarium software, and I think the SkyX, where you can actually position the off-axis guider exactly on the planetarium, show where your primary sensor is and where your off-axis guider. And then if you have a rotator or you have to move a little bit, you can position, you can frame your, your target such that you're pretty sure you're going to have a guide star. It's more of an issue with galaxies, as Molly mentioned, because if you're in a a nebula, there's certainly is you know you're right in the Milky Way. There's a lot of a lot of stars around. You probably won't have any issues. But in galaxies, and I think uh, if you have a long focal length, sometimes it can be very difficult to plan your target so that you can find the guide star. And just having a reducer in your off-axis guider is also, as Molly said, is also helped in finding a guide star. It looks like Alex is probably on the on the phone with our our guy and yeah, I hope and trying so. to find him. So I'm give give somebody a call. So hopefully, he yeah. had his. I, I have a spinning ball. Does um, anyone else see that no, on YouTube? It's all good. No. Um. We yeah. Are you questions? saying there's a? Are you saying there's a? You can do a focal length reducer for the for the off-axis guider itself, not not for the no. I, I'm, I'm talking about putting it on like like the off-axis guiders, the 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 camera, the main cam and the guide camera both behind the focal. You, can, you can put a a focal reducer in your off-axis guider. Yes, I, I have I have one because my field of view is very very small and I I typically don't have a star in it. And I, 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 I'm a galaxy guy, so I shoot out of the galactic plane. There's very little to, to snatch onto. Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think I have seen little tiny ones. I think I, I acquired one recently um, that could screw onto the end of a, of like a, anything with an inch and a quarter, and not like you would with a Barlow, but it's a reducer instead. <laughs> yeah, well, you also have, have to. You also have getting to consider. The I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, so the camera has to be has to be moved in a lot closer, Molly. So it is it mm. is an issue. So I had to move my off-axis guider toward the telescope to get enough back focus to put one of those in. So it, it's challenging. The other Sorry. thing to consider is when you choose, if you have a long focal length and you want to shoot galaxies, you should consider the size of the sensor in the off-axis guider. 
And of course, the larger the sensor, the better, and the more sensitive the sensor is, uh, the better off you are. When we ran the 16-inch RC, we had a really not a great off-axis guider, and there were some galaxies we couldn't shoot. With the current setup, with the plane wave, we're very sensitive off-axis guider, and I almost never have to worry about finding a guide star. So sensitivity of your off-axis guider and the size of the sensor makes a big difference in finding a guide star. Yeah, and what guide right. camera are you using for the 20 inch, Eric? Uh, gee, that was, I'm sorry you asked that question because I can't remember. It's a load star. <laughs> That'll teach is it a load oh, star? It okay. Yes, it's a load oh, star. <laughs> yeah, it's really quite sensitive. And I used to plan quite carefully about you know making sure I find a guide star. And I never plan anymore. I just I just frame my, my target and the guide stars appear. Yeah, I've never and, had to uh, shift my field of view to get a guide star after I put the load star on. Yeah, so that makes a huge difference. But I do remember with the 16 inch with the insensitive off axis guider saying there's nothing there to guide with. And you can get them used on Astromart relatively frequently. Um, like I have the original Lodestar, not even like the Lodestar X2. It does a great job. And um, one of my friends just bought one for like 150 on Astromart. Um, I think I, I, I bought mine off of a guy. I bought like got a bunch of stuff from him at one time. So I'm not exactly sure how much that individual piece was. But um, uh, and I bought that stuff, Eric. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they do come up on Astromart on occasion. And of course, you can change your exposure on your, on your guiding too. Yeah, I do with, at f10 on the nine and a quarter. I do five second exposures on the eight inch. I was doing uh, like eight second exposures. Yeah, Alex, do we have know yeah. any more? Um, I've uh, phoned Sid and uh, talked to his very nice message machine. Oh. Um, but if he were, you know, if he were, did the right thing, he, of course, turned off his phone so that there would be no way to interrupt him during the presentation. So I think we're going to be answering questions for, for a while here, and maybe he'll realize what's happening. Um, Tarek, another thing that you were talking about, and I don't know if you were answering me when you said this, is that you were going to buy a better mount and the kind of stability I was talking about, the kind of flexure that Tim was talking about, has nothing to do with the mount. It's all in the construction of the telescope. So changing mounts in itself will not get you the better guiding if, in fact, your tube is flexing or the mirrors are shaking or things like that. Now, uh, to go on a, a different, um, I'm looking for who posted it, but there was a question here about uh, any do any of us on the Astro Imaging Channel have any suggestions about comet filters? So do any of us know anything about I I know nothing. Well, I'm sorry. Well, why would you need? I'm not sure why you need a comet filter. They're basically, it's a, it's it's a, a whitish it's, tail with a green head. It's a broadband target. Yeah, yeah. it's a broadband target. So, so um, yeah. But as far as, yeah. you know, I've, I've done a bit of comet uh, most of the ones I see, they're in color, but, you know, you can get a much easier comet image if you just use your L filter and perhaps track the comet, get a, some kind of an animation. And those, are, to me, are as interesting as just the static pictures because comets move, right? How many things in the sky can we focus or can we target that actually move, you know, during our time frame? And the answer is, I guess, comets and asteroids and meteors. And mm -hmm. nobody focuses meteors. And nobody shoots meteors that I know of. Are we getting more questions? We'll get a question here. Yes. We're getting Auto uh, stacker, still the state of the art for planetary stacking. Yes, auto stacker is still for any kind of lucky imaging, whether it be planets, uh, whether it be the moon, whether it be, as Tim and I do, uh, our solar imaging. Auto stacker is still the program. Not to capture, but to process your captured images. And that's probably a subject that we've covered in a, in a couple of presentations and, you know, might be up for another presentation on lucky imaging because there are a couple new tools that you can use for lucky imaging, which incorporate auto stacker as well as some other tools. I think uh, uh, 
Tom Spirak, I uh, mentioned earlier, will be coming up with a couple of shows on his lunar imaging and I think some solar imaging in there too. So that, that might include some more information about that stuff. I think I heard a rumor that there might be an update coming for Registax, but I don't know if that is still true. Um, I think I think somebody else had volunteered to take on the project, but uh, I don't remember the details, but it's possible we may get an update for Registax. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure Registax is the go-to tool. Well, no. so like I use AutoStacker for the stacking, and right. then I use Registax for the wavelets. I used to use Registax for the stacking too until I was having lots of problems, switched to AutoStacker and AutoStacker didn't have those problems. Um, but even AutoStacker, it's getting on in years. Um, but you know, it, it's it's stacking. I don't know that there's a whole lot of other smarts. Uh, no, I think that. it is. And, and remember, there are some tools in PixInsight that I think probably surpass Registax. You know, probably, I, I could probably do wavelets in PixInsight, but just being able to move those sliders in Registax is just really nice. Yeah, frankly, I've done it. I've done it both ways, and um, I, I personally think Registax is uh, is a little easier as well, Molly. I, I find it easy to, you know, just kind of do a the old you know WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Kind of slip the sliders around rather than yeah. sitting there tweaking numbers in uh, you know multi scale linear transform or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have either of you used uh, BlurX? For solar no, I just for recently solar. bought. I recently bought Star X Terminator because uh, for the comet, being able to remove stars from linear mode images is a huge benefit. But yeah, I haven't. I haven't bought the other exterminator tools yet. So well, you if, know, if, if you, you read use... about if you read about Blur Exterminator, Eric, you'll you'll find out that they use stars uh, in the image to um, to determine the PSF. So trying to use it for planetary or solar would be a challenge uh... because there's no star. Uh, okay. By the way, uh, Molly, if you do use Star Exterminator for solar images, you won't have anything left. <laughs> <laughs> I was just waiting for that cackle. Good. Very good. Very nice. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I have actually tried it, and there are some results. I mean, you can put in the, the PSF, and you can get, since it is kind of like nebulosity, for solar images, there are some interesting things that can be done. I, I yeah. would kind of disagree, not totally, but kind of disagree I, not using it. They do say, if, if you read the documentation, that if you if you have um, other images with stars from the same uh, from the same system, then you could take the PSF from that and use it in an image without mm -hmm. stars. The yeah, problem with that is with your solar scope. Um, Eric, you're, you're spe speaking specifically about solar. We're not going to get any stars through there. So, you know, it's... Um, that's that's true. Yeah. That so, being said, I like to count on, you know, my experience rather than the documentation. Besides, I don't read the documentation anyway. So just, just, just keep pushing the buttons and, and seeing what we get. Alex, we have any communication from our... I haven't, I haven't heard back from Sid, uh, but, you know, I want to say something. Um, we have worked really hard in the last four years or something not to have an open session. We have worked really hard to make sure we've got a presenter for you every Sunday. And it's not always easy. I think you've heard me mention that we need more presenters and more volunteers to come in here. And one of the things that you may or may not realize is that we actually monitor the number of people watching the show as we go through the show to see just how we're doing. Sid was doing marvelously well. His audience kept growing and people were not leaving. They were staying here with us. Um, but I got to tell you that since Sid left us and by inadvertently getting out of the Google Meet session, um, you guys have stayed right there while we've been just discussing astroimaging ideas for you. Uh, so continue to ask your questions for a while. And as long as we've got the questions, we'll answer them for you, hoping somehow Sid will get back to us. And I, I'm going to ask Sid to come back again, because I kind of like the way he was telling the story. It was one of those, everything you need to know about astroimaging from somebody who went through it and learned it. And I think that there's a lot of people that could get something out of that for us. So we'll continue to do that. Any other questions out there that our no, but there's an interesting people. comment, so I, I have to read this so I get it correctly. Uh, Josh said, documentation is for experts to learn 
They've been doing it wrong forever. I got to catch up to that. Guilty. <laughs> of, you know, you, you, re you read like the instruction manual, for instance, early on, and then you use it for a couple of years and then you look at it again and you're like, oh, I didn't realize I needed to do that maintenance step or, oh, I didn't realize I had that feature. <laughs> I feel like documentation is not dissimilar. <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't imagine any of us, well, maybe Tim, focuses too much on the documentation. I always I, read I the think documentation, it's just, but I'm, I'm a nerd. You know, yeah, I think it's, it's just laziness. <laughs> you know, if, if we have a piece of software and we can't figure it out just by playing with it, then it's probably too complicated. And now the one exception is Pix Insight. So if I didn't read some of the documentation on Pix Insight, I'd still be scratching my head. Uh, you know, four years after trying it in the first place. I do find that their... Touch my head even after reading it back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do find that their tool true. tips to be pretty helpful. How you can hover over a setting and it describes it, but sometimes you have to only read part of it because the rest of it's less relevant to what you're trying to find out. <laughs> they have a lot of controls. If, I find if I read all their tool tips, I go... Oh, I don't understand that, and I don't understand that. So here, we'll just do what I did before and see whether it works. Hey. Now, except for except for Tim, that probably reads all the tools. To, <laughs> just being in there. All right, that's enough shots of Tim. Hey, uh, oh, that's all right. You can Josh, shoot back. I mean, it's, I get it. It's all right. Josh <laughs> asked a question a little while ago. Asked, "What is a wavelet?" Um, ah, what, oh, that's I'm a not good sure question. I'm qualified to answer that, but I'll try. Maybe somebody else can tell me why Molly wow. raised her hand um it it's basically a method of sharpening where they look at uh structures of increasing size um uh, uh to um uh, and, and an attempt to use those structures and the contrast enhancements on those structures to sharpen the image molly how'd i do yeah, that's good yeah so like yeah. um like layer one for instance is your one by one features so like your single pixel noise for instance um so like if you use multi-scale transform and you use a um like uh, a setup that somebody else had made you might notice that layer one has the most adjustment on it um because that's the single <laughs> pixel stuff layer two is two by two and layer three is four by four and layer four is 16 by 16 i think it goes up by orders of two if I yes recall. powers of two yes yeah um yeah. so yeah go ahead can I ask a question of our audience? You know, I, I see, even though we've lost our presenter, that most of the people have hung with us. Uh, do you find our banner here just like filling up time and you'd rather be somewhere else? So, I mean, if you agree that it could be productive and perhaps we might once in a while have a topic or two where we could do this, kind of, you know, how to raise your hand, what, what would be the proper symbol? This thumbs I, up. Of I course, if it's thumbs good. down, you know, we, we understand thumbs down too. So the people out there in, in YouTube, tell us what you think about this. Yeah, please do. While you're doing that, I wanted to point out one other thing about wavelets. Have you ever noticed that um, when you turn your computer on and then you go to the uh, sign on screen, you get kind of a, a picture of, um, of your sign on screen, but it's, but it's just the very haziest haziest part of it it's like a cloud with general shapes of things like that that is one labelet wavelet in your jpeg and then as you start signing in it all gets more clear they've added more of the layers of the wavelet and each layer of the wavelet is adding more detail to the picture so that's one of the ways you can envision wavelets okay or at least that's what happens in windows my windows. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, <laughs> I don't think my windows loads that slowly. <laughs> anyway, but uh, a JPEG, depending on how many layers it's got, has a very cloudy pictures with the general shapes, the big shapes. And then above that, it's got more detailed shapes and then more detailed, more detailed. And each layer is a wavelet, is, a, is based on a wavelet size. Hey, I, I, it scrolled by too quickly and I've forgotten, or I missed who uh, asked the question, but someone asked, 
how what how well Registax works for lunar and solar images. Um, uh, Eric, you I know you. Yeah, um, I've I've used it for years. I'm kind of you know like moving away from Registax, but as long as you set up your parameters and have your presets, it works pretty good for both. And I'm not sure there's a whole lot of difference between solar and lunar as far as the quality of that. It, it does take some experimentation to find out just what those set of parameters are. Uh, I've also read online if somebody has a, a set, I'll try it out. And I have my presets all set up for Registax. And I'll usually do a Registax, Registax sharpening and then go into PixInsight and try some other things or take it into Photoshop and, and do some of the, you know, the tricks that we have there. It's still a useful tool. And I found as far as like having presets go, um, how far I can push the presets depends on which telescope I'm using and how good the seeing mm -hmm. was. Some nights when the seeing sun is good, I have to really pull those sliders down very low because I just can't, if I try and push them up higher, I get nasty artificial yuckiness. But when the seeing is really good, then I can really push them and uh, pull out some really nice detail. So I don't save presets. I do each one separately because uh, the, no two images are ever the same for me. I mean, you can save any number of presets, so. I mean, it would, I'd still have to adjust them anyway, so I may as well just do each one as it, as it comes along. So, so now we have a, a great light bulb that is, has come on that Molly presented. If seeing is better, we get better images. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the seeing in Ohio is very often bad. <laughs> Well, you could be out in California now where your observatory is buried in five feet of snow. <laughs> You'll have to find out whether the seeing is any better up at 5,000 feet in New Mexico. Cross my fingers it is. <laughs> we'll see. Patrick? I, I saw your face flash up here. Oh, it just, it depends on where you are. One of the things about being uh, out west here is we've got the, you know, we've got the mountains to the to the west frequently and that will uh, stir up the air as it's as it's coming across so depending where you are in new mexico you may have better seeing you may not and somewhat counterintuitively at least to me the people who have the best seeing are people who live on the coast um john talbot on the gulf coast and mainly Phil, uh, christopher go in the philippines lives on the coast and he has as we have all if you've seen Christopher Goh's planetary images, you know that they rival Hubble's, and he just has extremely steady atmosphere as a result of being near the water, which doesn't make sense to me, but for some reason the atmospherics are better there. So no, 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 it's it's you know Big Bear Solar Observatory uh, up in Big Bear Lake in California here. Um, it is on the lake. They they you know put down some dirt, put the thing out in the middle of the lake, and that water doesn't change temperature as quickly as True. as soil does and so there, there's much more stable air right there and that's why the big bear solar observatory is on the middle of a lake True. You know? it's all about it's that awesome. layman or flow it also helps if you're on the upsweep to the like the sierras rather than on the on the mm -hmm. east side because as the air goes up it's reasonably steady like at the sro but as it goes over the top of the peaks, it's like the, you know, a foil of an airplane. It's it's going to be yeah. stirred up. Which is why Mount Palomar and Mount Wilson are where they are, because they're at the at the crest of the um, of the wind coming out the Pacific. Yeah. Any more? You got another question here? What's this? Yeah, there there was one a moment ago from Tarek. <clears throat> excuse me about whether we think it's a good idea to change from the stock focuser. I'm not sure there's a one and done answer for that because it's going to depend heavily on, on what the focuser yeah, is. On what who the stock <laughs> focuser is. I've, I've had scopes where uh, the, the, the focuser that I got was very loose and, um, and I changed it right away and I've had others that I didn't have to change it at all. So I think that really depends and is just something you're going to have to check out on a scope by scope basis. Well, the one thing that you probably would, if you have an, an SCT and you have their stock focuser, which is grabbing that big internal mirror on one edge and then moving it with this giant screw, I would probably recommend you get to one that's sitting on the, the end of 
of the scope because no matter what you do, when you move that focuser, that that image, uh, that mirror is going to jiggle and things yeah. are going to move. Oh yeah, with the but with the there's no SC, way around that. With an SCT, you absolutely have to have a, a focuser, an additional focuser on the back. An additional sure. focus, Crayford, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Craig Bird, Rack and Pinion, whatever it is, but mm -hmm. something back there. Don't try Bird, to focus with the... And Celestron is actually, I mean, they're well aware of this, and they've actually, in their current scopes, you can lock down that mirror, yes. which is exactly the point exactly. of saying, yeah. <laughs> saying you shouldn't use this focuser if, yeah, so I, unless you're I doing a, visual. I have a, for, for doing imaging, I have a Prima Lucha Asado, which um, has very small steps, and uh, which isn't as necessary for a Schmidt Cassett grain because the focus point is kind of broad, but um, it's, it's very reliable. And I put the, I put the focus, I put the camera in the middle of the focuser. It's like I, I moved the focuser to its middle position. I focus the Schmidt Cassett grain mirror. I lock it down and then I never touch the mirror again. That's, <laughs> yep. That's I think exactly what I did. Yep. I had, I, I used to have a, an edge scope as well. And I did the same thing with a moonlight focuser. Uh, and and did it exactly how you described it, Molly. And I think that's the right thing to do for an SCT. Yeah, and, I, and so then I don't get like because um, you can get uh, mirror flop with Schmidt Cassegrains very easily. Where mm -hmm. um, so like I used to have an, I have an 11 inch Schmidt Cassegrain that I used to use, and whenever I flipped around the meridian, the mirror would shift, and it would it would change my focus pretty significantly, and it also changed where the stars appeared on the camera so that when I tried to do like a 200 point alignment model on my Paramount, it was never good. My my uh, pointing accuracy was always like, my, the RMS was like 200 arc seconds. It was really bad. Um, and so now I have, my, my eight inch has basically no mirror flop even though it doesn't have the locking pins, but my nine and a quarter has the locking pins and I have like 40 arc seconds of RMS error, which is much better. <laughs> Um, for, for the pointing on the um, the pointing accuracy on the on the paramount but and then also my focus doesn't really shift as I go across the meridian either yeah in fact Marsha's asking about her edge 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 11 and I I would say that's something to take a look at lock down that mirror on the on the edge 11 especially the 11 and, and the 14 and yeah get yourself either a Crayford or some kind of focuser uh, in, in the optical train. Like I said, I use Moonlight with great success. There are many, um, but uh, but that's, that's uh, hopefully I answered your question, Marsha. Uh, let's see here. So the silence means we're all looking over on YouTube Sorry, to see yeah, what your reading. questions are. Yeah, we're seeing... Trying to answer your questions as best we can. There's we're not looking away from you. We're just looking over on our other monitor on YouTube. There's a question from Josh Kovach about, um, does anyone have any tips on combining one-shot color subs with other, uh, like, like uh, of different filters, like combining uh, a light pollution filter with a narrowband filter for one-shot color cameras? Any thoughts um, on that? I don't have any thoughts. I've All thought right. about doing it. Um, well, so one instance where I have, I think I've thought about doing it is like some like a target like a M82, the Cigar Galaxy, where you have that hydrogen alpha outflow. But when you're doing a galaxy, you really want to do it in, in broadband light. So with your light pollution filter, if you happen to be unfortunate and live under light pollution like me, um, and I thought about extracting the red channel from uh, the from the narrow band filter, like the L, L Ultimate or an L Extreme, and mixing that in to the color data with the wide band filter, just like I do when I mix in hydrogen alpha to monochrome RGB. And I thought about doing that. I haven't done it yet, but I know some people who have done stuff like that. So how broad is that filter? The um, the light pollution filter. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it depends on which one you use. I have an astronomic CLS, which basically cuts out everything between like, um, everything in the yellow. It's pretty, a pretty broad swath that gets cut out. Um, but I also have an L pro, which 
is a little more selective in the wavelengths in the in the yellow area that it cuts out to mainly focus on those um, uh, street lights like uh, mercury and sodium vapor street lights get cut more precisely out of there. But they are quite broadband. Um, another filter I have actually that's really interesting is I have an Antlia Ultra, what's it called? Antlia RGB Ultra, I think it's called. And it's it's narrower around RGB than a light pollution filter. And it has um, it has more in the red, but it's broader than a, than a narrowband filter. And so it, it's kind of a mix between a narrowband and a broadband filter, which is really interesting. Um, but uh, I've got some images. I'm actually imaging M82 right now with that filter to see if I can pick up that hydrogen alpha while also getting the broadband at the same time with one filter. So that image will be coming out soon. But, so why yeah. not just use an HA filter and then add it to M82? You very well could. Um, I like um, in my filter wheel. I already I have an L ultimate. I have an L extreme. I could just use those and extract the red and get the same result as putting an H alpha filter in there without having to actually take up a filter space. I, I've always had a problem with with uh, trying to use an HA filter with an OSC camera though. Because you put an HA filter in there, the only pixels that are going to fire are the red pixels. So yeah. you're only getting a quarter of the light. You're right. Um, it's not as it's never going to be as good as doing it with monochrome. Exactly. And and but, so sometimes those uh, you know those dual um, narrow band or those quad band filters do a little better job um, you know in those situations because they still allow the other um, the other. Uh, wavelengths to come through, but if you you throw an HA filter on there, you're only getting a quarter of the light through. Well, then, like, but, um, you, if you if there is O3 light or H beta light in that galaxy, you could potentially mix that in too with the with the blue channel, the right. green and the blue channel. Mm -hmm. um, remember, remember a ways back when we were just started this, uh, somebody asked about comet filters, and we said, "Eh, I can't really think of a use for them." Uh, there are some light pollution filters that may help if you're trying to take that picture of a comet in a heavily light polluted area because it's going to cut out the light um the, the, those colors of the light pollution however that may be taking out some of the colors of the um, of the broadband mm -hmm. um comet but yeah. it's, it's worth a try i, I mean what's it cost you to try these things i always get better color on my galaxies when i'm under darker skies and don't have to mm -hmm. use a light pollution filter because there's right. a lot of yellow from main sequence stars and galaxies that you lose when you use light pollution filter. However, light pollution can be so bad. Like I live in Bortle seven that not using one makes my images more or less unusable. So it's, it's worthwhile to me to use a light pollution filter just to get an image, even if I have to go futz with the color, um, than to just have it be so drowned out in background. Like, cause not, not only is the light pollution affecting your overall background, but every additional photon that hits your sensor is increasing the shot noise. So your noise is actually also higher when you're when you're not using a light pollution filter in a light polluted area. So you can actually reduce your noise to some extent uh, by using a light pollution filter and not allowing as much of the city light to hit your camera sensor and cause shot noise. Just moving on to a different topic because Turek wants us to move on to a different topic. Uh, just kidding you, Turek. Uh, but he's asking, what's the best autofocuser out there? Oh, that's a that is a loaded question for yeah. absolute sure. And and the answer is, I would say there are several quality brands which do a fine job. And I think the only other comment would be there are certain brands that come with uh, less expensive scopes where you want to just rip off the focuser right away and get one of the more quality brands. But I wouldn't recommend one over we're, another. We're yeah. talking about autofocus auto motors here. Autofocus motor or yeah. autofocusers? You know, the like like, like the, what's the ZWO? ZWO product? one? Yeah. yeah. Or I, 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 a motorized autofocuser as opposed to just the actual focuser itself, I think is maybe what he's going after. And he did say that uh, he's specifically asking for uh, having a GSO 10 inch RC. Okay, that's for Turek. He's also asked about a few others, but you know what? I've got um, uh, I've got two 
well, I've got lots of different setups and uh, two of them or three of them, I think uh, uh, one, the one uses this ZWO product and the other three uses, oh gosh, what's it called? It's so old. I never even deal with it, but I've got them and they work fine. Um, Robo focus. Oh um, yeah, I have one of those. Yeah, I have yeah. one of those in the telescope museum. <laughs> they, we yeah. all have a port on it, then I had to use a serial to USB converter. <laughs> yeah, they they just they don't care, and it, basically they fit anywhere. So so does the the ZWO part. I think probably any of them do. Um, oh, yeah. You just bend the metal right, and you get yeah. the right screws and bolts, and put it all together. And what I like about the ZWO is that it's kind of one piece. Uh, I don't try to move my big ccd and you know seven inch filter or seven posi nine position filter wheel on it and stuff like that um but i suppose it would work i don't know i i couldn't i couldn't tell you it would seem to me that people would have to try 10 different brands to tell you which one's the best and i'm not any sure any of us go down that road so yeah, I, think think you well, a, I think you have to look at a few facts like your what is your critical focus and your step size of your focuser because you could be it could be way out you could just never achieve focus because you only have two or three steps or you have 100 steps in that area so yeah you have that's to something that consideration as well but don't they all don't offer consider. that no you, they cannot, all? You, you can't change the step size a step size is determined by gearing and other things that's a physical constraint hmm. critical focus well again that's that's your telescope you're not going to be changing that so you have to get something that matches so you have to determine what your critical focus is and look at the step sizes in microns to see if it fits your telescope accordingly yep. yes, do your I, homework do. I don't know how many people uh when they set up their system calculate the critical I, focus zone I do. and it's yeah. it's a fairly oh i know terry does and i do but it's a fairly easy thing to do and it's part of it's also part of when you do have your focus or your autofocus or running, how big a step size you should go through in order not to be totally within the critical zo focus zone for a number of steps or jump right through it without realizing how big it is. So probably one of the first things you do is measure your critical focus zone, which is a micrometer and uh, the readings on your, your autofocus or, and a little formula and you have it. I just move it a number of steps and see if it changes enough. And if it doesn't, I increase the steps. And if it does, I dec if it moves too much, I decrease the steps. <laughs> Calculate your critical focus zone, Molly. Or see what works in the practical field. Hey, hey, let me uh, <laughs> jump in real quick to answer Tarek's question um, or, or provide another answer, I should say, to Tarek's question. For that GSO RC10, you might want to take a look at Rainbow Astro. They have a focuser that goes on the secondary. Uh, so everything in the, um, in the uh, optical train in the back is fixed and you move the secondary uh, backwards and forwards. And uh, it's, a, it's a pretty slick little setup and pretty stable. So something to go and take a look at if you have a mind to wreck. On, on an RC, so you take out those screws in front and you... Yeah, there's an assembly that replaces the, the uh, uh, you know, what happens in the front vein and you, yeah. uh, you, you put that focuser on there with the with the secondary mirror on it and uh then there's uh, obviously electronics there that you talk to and uh move the secondary mirror in and out uh, to focus and so uh, you know everything that's screwed onto the back of the scope is fixed there's there's no focuser back there so what do you do about collimation because in the rc you're always fiddling with those oh, it, the collimation screws are still there so you can you can still collimate the the secondary as you always did. Yeah. Collimating the RC is always an adventure. Yeah, it actually makes it one step easier because you don't have a focuser on the back of the RC that could possibly slip. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, so once you once you collimate the the focuser the 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 back of the RC, not the primary, but the uh, where the focuser goes, um, then it it should stay that way forever because there's nothing there to move. How are we doing on time, Alex? We, We're over. We've we got all the time our audience wants. We're staying at 66. We dropped down to 60, and we're, we're up 62, 66. 60, people so are we're, staying we're with us. basically staying with us. Um, I would hate to try to do this every week, though, because, you know, 
we'd run out of knowledge. I don't think we'd run out of knowledge. <laughs> we'd run out of we'd, yeah, but we'd wind up saying the same stuff over and over again and answering <laughs> the same questions from the same people. So, you know. Yeah, um, we've been going for a little over an hour. So it's, I, I don't think we're going to get Sid back and it might be time to start wrapping No, up. I've, I've uh, emailed Sid. I've called him. And uh, I think maybe um, maybe at the annual show, uh, we'll have a 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning. And remember, we have to have our um, – and for those of you who haven't seen an annual show, um, uh, years ago when we first started off, we were just – we just did this sometimes, okay, what we've been doing here. Um, we eventually got to the point where we decided to make a corporation so that it didn't depend on one person doing everything all the time. And uh, we've got a great group of people. Well, we actually had a meeting today before the show started uh, where we spent, well, between Eric and I and Tolga, and we spent about an hour and a half before we got here. The rest of the crew came in, spent an hour with us. So we we there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on in the Astro Imaging Channel besides just having the show on Sunday night. The reason I'm telling you that is because um, we – we want to give you the best shows possible. Well, one of the shows we do every year is the end of the year show where we tell you about who's watching us, how many people watching, um, what kind of shows we've been having, uh, what our audience looks like and stuff like that. We just do that once a year just to remind you that we're more than just what you guys see on Sunday. Um, well, that only takes 10 or 15 minutes. And then we have two tutorials after that and maybe uh since um sid has another half of his program to go we'll put him on for that that portion of the time it's not till june but that gives him a chance to finish it i think um later on we'll splice that together into one big sid show and and leave it at that okay um and having said that do we have any more new questions or should it should we call it what do you think guys i don't know our pleasure. Thank you for. I don't see any more questions. What do you okay. want to do, Alex? This was a good discussion. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was um, fun. Thank you for asking all these questions. And please, every time that we're on every week, ask questions of of our speaker. Uh, that's that's one of the great benefits of us being live is being able to have our speaker answer your questions live. So uh, this this was great. And keep asking those questions and don't feel silly about it. Okay, we're gonna say good night because. We're going to say good night. Good night. <laughs> good night. Uh, who's good in night, charge everyone. of me tonight? No. Good night, everyone. See you next week. Or, sorry, Tim. Tim is. Tim is. Right? Tim. Tim, your turn. Good night. Take us out, buddy. <laughs> <laughs>